from Tom Vose, a former Bank of England economist who is now head of economic research at the National Bank of Australia. Tom, good to see you again. So, first of all, just to get your thoughts, your reaction uh, to the minutes, essentially showing that the vote was unanimous for a second round of quantitative easing here in the UK and unanimous on the overall amount of this QE at £75 billion. That was a compromise. Remember, they looked at 50 and they looked at 100 billion. So they, there's more to come. What this really tells us is after February, they're going to look again and we think they'll then do another 75 billion, taking it to about 150 billion in this round or about 25% of UK GDP in total. The vote tells you that they were a bit scared about the international economy. Mervyn yesterday blamed it all on Europe. Uh, therefore, they're supporting domestic demand in the UK. So more to come is really the key of, the, of those minutes. So £75 billion pounds doesn't go far enough? Apparently not. Remember, they're trying to support lower. They're trying to support asset prices through the mechanism of lowering gilt yields, giving cash to banks and to insurance companies, and so that they in turn will go out and buy other assets. And the hope is it's that, that transformation that leaks it into the economy. Now, remember when they did their first bit of QE, markets were distressed. We had dysfunctional bond markets. We had dysfunctional credit markets. This time round, markets are actually a little bit calmer. So the argument now is they'll get much less reaction in this round of QE than they did from the first. So that's why they'll have to do a much bigger slug. So if we're going to see QE3, QE4, you're saying that this essentially was a compromise that we'll see another 75 billion in a couple of months from now. Is that, I suppose some would question the wisdom of that with inflation at 5.2%. Well, remember, the middle of next year, we're going to start to see inflation coming back below 3%. The fact that we peaked so early in September does give us some comfort that we will see lower inflation by the end of this year than we do at the moment. Early next year, as VAT drops out, that's going to be worth about another 1.2 percentage points off CPI. So we'll be looking at 3% when QE ends at some stage. I think at, th at that point, hopefully, real GDP growth will have started to accelerate because they're trying to target nominal GDP. GDP growth as inflation falls off, lo and behold, the economy accelerates. And the Bank of England predicted this, didn't, didn't they? I mean, they've been saying for months now that we are going to see inflation in the UK of at least 5%. But what is the danger of it essentially becoming entrenched in the economy? What if it doesn't come down next year as they are predicting? Well, this is a technical argument. What are you doing to inflation expectations? We have seen them creep up. So inflation is at 5% and we're printing money. Do you start to lead people to think I've lost purchasing power and therefore demand wages? Their view is the output gap is so large, domestic demand is so depressed, and the unemployment rolls are so high that we're not going to see that wage catch up. And so we won't entrench those inflation expectations into underlying inflation. If we do, however, see industrial action and we see a wave of pay claims in the January to April period when about 90% of UK wages are made, then they'll have made a mistake. But what does this do? What does inflation at this level do for wages and spending power? Well, obviously, inflation means that households have less money to pay down their debt. Remember, the reason for doing all of this is to try and deleverage the economy as quickly as possible. But when people are spending more on petrol, more on their energy bills, more on food, there's less money available to actually pay down that debt. So perversely, by generating inflation, we're slowing down the deleveraging process of the UK household. Deleveraging versus the need for greater consumer spending. And actually, Tom, just wanted to get into I just wanted to get into a comment. You mentioned Mervyn King there, and he made a speech in Liverpool last night. Let's just listen to a little bit of what he had to say now, because he is essentially outlining some of the big problems, big challenges facing policymakers in this country right now. The main impediment to the strategy of rebalancing our economy is markedly slower growth in our major export markets, especially in the rest of Europe. That's why we are treading a fine line between stimulus to demand in the short run and a rebalancing away from private and public consumption towards exports and import substitution in the longer run. Just how complex a process, how difficult a process is that going to be, Tom? Well, the difficulty is in previous rebalancing exercises, the most successful, of course, being Canada's, they had a next-door neighbour, the US, that was growing at a very fast rate so they could rebalance quite quickly. They could cut spending and they could rely on exports. In the UK's case, just as we're trying to do that, we then find out that mainland Europe is beginning to slow down. It's growing by less than 2%. And so suddenly the export markets that you were looking for are no longer there. Now, in aggregate, there are still strong export markets in Germany and France, and we seem to be doing better there. But overall, we would prefer Europe 
to be growing at 3%, uh, not the 2 and indeed the 1% it's likely to grow in next year. Does more aid for Greece mean less sovereignty for them? It, it does indeed. And yesterday we saw Angela Merkel perhaps suggesting there should be a permanent troika looking after Greece. So Greece is permanently enthralled to the EU Commission, the IMF and the ECB. Why is that? To make sure that if there is a default, if the private sector do take a large haircut, that Greece doesn't slip back on its structural adjustment. They still want the assets to be privatised. They still want a reduction in the number of civil servants. And they need to raise the trend rate of growth so that we don't see another Greek default 20, 30 years down the line. Do the actual targets in terms of a timeline need to be adjusted? Because it seems as though all year Greece has been struggling to meet its targets. You speak about the privatization plan. That process has been, well, the progress of that process has been glacial. Does there need to be an adjustment in expectations here? Uh, well, I think the reason why we're planning to hurry up and wait is to try and get the politics out of the way. If the government can get a bill through starting privatization, then it doesn't really mm. matter when it happens, but at least we now can know that this, this can happen. And if need be, the EU is willing to send in its technocrats to actually run the process in extremis, but they need political support first. Uh, I think that the quarterly rounds aren't helpful. Every quarter we run up to the, what are the Greek deficit target? Have, is there more slippage? Will they get the package through? We really need to come to an end, which will be a very large haircut for the private sector that reduces Greek debt levels by at least 30%. And so we start to see them getting back on track with a sustainable basis, in which case the funding then should be automatic. But we need to get away from these quarterly bouts of nerves. Tom, would the House of receptive or the private sector be to a, a bigger haircut? Are we sensing a change of tone from the International Institute for Finance? Are you you sensing that? Yes. I mean, the initial, of course, the initial position is always going to be, well, we've already accepted a 21% loss. We really don't want to take anything else. But with governments putting pressure on them and indeed talking about forced recapitalization, I think there will be an adjustment. But in return, they will ask for something back. A larger haircut will probably come in the form of a very long maturity extension. The original plan had 15 years. The new one could have 30, 40, even 50 years worth of par bonds being exchanged. The, the worry would be that within 20 or 30 years we end up in a Greek default scenario again. So the banks will demand much more structural reform in Greece, uh, an attempt to boost the trend rate of growth so the fiscal dynamics mm. are much improved. And of course the big news today, Germany and France supporting recapitalization of the region's banks. This was reported in the UK's Guardian newspaper. Is this a good thing and if so what form would recapitalization take Tom? Well <clears throat> at the moment the plan is and they've been doing quite a lot of discussion about this. Uh, private sector first, public sector in at the very last level. And remember, the EFSF cannot directly recapitalise banks. It can only lend money to governments to recapitalise their own banks. The banks themselves, I think, would love governments to recapitalise them with 0% preferred shares. In return, they might be asked not to pay bonuses or dividends until the shares are back. But with most banks trading about 60% of book mm. equity. Um, if you raise finance at the moment, it's very expensive. It will dilute your shareholders, so preference shares, I think, would be, be the preferred vehicle of recapitalization. If you want to do it like the states, you do it to everybody. So you say, I don't care whether you think you have enough capital, you're all going to have to take a slug. The fitter ones can pay back more rapidly. How's that going to go down with taxpayers? Um, well, I, again, the question you have is if it's a government guarantee and it's all done through stuff, will taxpayers know that their pockets have been picked? I mean, the whole plan really throughout all of this has been to use taxpayers' money in the form of guarantees, which are contingent liabilities and which never called on.